Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. Us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, who in thy wisdom and goodness hast appointed the office of rulers and parliament for the welfare of society and the just government of men, we beseech thee to behold with thy abundant favor us thy servants, whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of important thrust in silence. Let thy blessing descend upon us here assembled, and grant that we may treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote thy honor and glory, and to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of these islands, and of those whose interests thou hast committed to our charge. And this we beg through Jesus Christ his sake. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Bill. Members, the House are now officially open. The minutes of the sitting from the 26th of November have been circulated. <clears throat> are there any omissions or amendments or corrections? There are none. The minutes will be printed. You'll stand as printed. Messengers from the governor, there are none. <coughs> Excuse me. Announcements by the speaker, there are none. Messengers from the Senate, there are none. Papers on the communications to the House. There's one paper this morning in in the name of the Premier. Honorable Premier, would you like to present your paper at this time? Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Mr. Speaker, I have the honor to attach and submit for the information of the Honorable House of Assembly the report to the Commission of Inquiry into Historic Land Losses in Bermuda. Thank you. Petitions? There are none. Reports by ministers and junior ministers. Members, there are six reports, six statements this morning. The first is in the name of the Premier. Very much like to present your statement at this time. Sure, uh, Mr. Speaker. Continue. Put on my glasses. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, progress in any society can be achieved in several ways. The history of many nations and peoples has shown that the past, no matter how painful or controversial, must be openly and fearlessly addressed. There is no requirement for people to agree a common history as shared experiences are often differently perceived and recalled. However, so much of history has been whispered or unrecorded. The Commission of Inquiry into Historic Land Losses has afforded an opportunity to those whose voices had either been silenced or ignored to openly tell their story and to be heard. Mr. Speaker, honorable members will recall that it was during the proceedings of this honorable house on the 4th of July, 2014, the late honorable member C. Walton Brown Jr., a member of the Bermuda Progressive Labor Party, then the official opposition, introduced the motion which ultimately led to the establishment of this commission of inquiry. Aggrieved at community reports, of land stolen from citizens of Bermuda, he characterized his vision for pursuing historic losses of land in Tucker's town in this way. And I quote, Mr. Speaker, we have an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to help correct some of the wrongs of the bad old days when justice was a fleeting illusion for many and where the rich, the powerful, and the connected acted with impunity. The theft of land the dispossession of property took place in this country on a wide scale and over a long period of time. The villains in these actions, Mr. Speaker, were oftentimes lawyers, real estate agents, and politicians, but not exclusively so. The victims were at times the poor and the marginalized, but not always. 
What the victims shared, though, Mr. Speaker, was an inability to show to secure a just outcome. End quote. The parliamentary debate that followed revealed that not only were there particular concerns regarding two of the most well-known expropriations in Bermuda, Tucker's Town and St. David's Island, but also concerns regarding widespread injustices in dealing with losses of land in other areas across the island. The motion approved by this House was as follows, and I quote, to take note of historic losses in Bermuda of citizens' property through theft of property, dispossession of property, and adverse possession claims, and be it resolved that this Honorable House calls on His Excellency the Governor to establish a commission of inquiry into all such known claims and to determine where possible the viability of any such claims and make recommendations for any victims of wrongful action to receive compensation and justice, end quote. Honorable members will likewise recall that then Governor Mr. George G. Ferguson refused to issue an order establishing a commission of inquiry, stating in a letter read to the House of Assembly, and I quote, I have concluded that these concerns are neither so clear nor so urgent as to justify my taking the still unusual step of commissioning an inquiry under the 1935 Act, end quote. Mr. Speaker, the legislature, in its wisdom, approved amendments to the relevant legislation, and as such, pursuant to Section 1A of the Commissions of Inquiry Act 1935, I, with the support of the Cabinet, determined to appoint a commission for this purpose on the 19th of June 2019, and caused public notification in the official gazette on the 1st of November 2019. Mr. Speaker, Honorable members will no doubt recall that the Commission of Inquiry's terms of reference were to first, inquire into historic losses of citizens' property in Bermuda through theft of property, dispossession of property, adverse possession claims, and or such other unlawful or regular means by which land was lost in Bermuda. Second, collect and collate any and all evidence and information available relating to the nature and extent of such historic losses of citizens' property. Third, prepare a list of all land to which such historic losses relate. Fourth, identify any persons, whether individuals or parties corporate, responsible for such historic losses of citizens' property. And fifth, to refer as appropriate matters to the Director of Public Prosecution for such further action as may be determined necessary by that office. Mr. Speaker, in advance of receipt to the final report, the Cabinet took note of an executive summary which set out the procedures adopted as well of the Commission of Inquiry's recommendations. Mr. Speaker, the members appointed to the Commission were serving as Chair, the Honorable Retired Justice Norma Wayne Miller, OBE, Retired Puny Judge of the Bermuda Supreme Court. Deputy Chair, the Honorable Wayne Parenchiff, CPM, Retired Assistant Commissioner of Police, former Minister for National Security, Minister of Culture, Human Affairs, and Minister Responsible for the National Drug Commission. Mrs. Maxine Bins, LLB, Barrister and Attorney, former consultant legal counsel with business development and retired legislative assistant with the Bermuda with the business development unit. Mrs. Frederica Forth, JP, former vice president of a local bank and experienced realtor. Mrs. Linda Milligan White, LLB, JP, senior legal counsel practicing at the Bermuda Bar, former minister of legislative affairs and women's issues. Mr. Jonathan Starling, Economic and Cooperative Development Officer, Bermuda Economic Development Corporation. Mr. Quinton Stubble, Professional Land Surveyor. Mr. Speaker, I am grateful to these commissioners for their service and the incredibly detailed and diligent manner 
in which they approach the mammoth task. Mr. Speaker, the Commission of Inquiry decided that it should call for and examine evidence and then determine whether such evidence taken as a whole demonstrated a structural problem which was either historic or nature and or which demonstrated systemic failure. Each case filed before the Commission of Inquiry was examined with the Commission, then determining whether the particular case represented an instance of historic loss of land by a citizen of Bermuda through theft or dispossession of property, adverse possession claims, or other unlawful or regular means by which land was lost in Bermuda. To ensure that the Commission of Inquiry's work was known within the community, a website was created. The website contained basic information about the background and composition of the Commission Inquiry, as well as its operational rules and procedures. To attract further the attention of members of the community who may wish to make claims, the COI placed newspaper advertisements inviting persons to apply for standing, or if they did not wish to have standing, to share information with the Commission of Inquiry. To broaden the Commission's reach, social media notifications about upcoming hearings were posted and periodic press statements were issued to the traditional media. Mr. Speaker, I would like to invite honorable members to take note that the Commission of Inquiry, from April through to July 2021, met with numerous experts for assistance, clarifying outstanding queries and giving historical context to practices that may have occurred in the past. Adhere to all COVID-19 restrictions in place. Arrangements were made to accommodate those who cannot appear in person, including commissioners themselves on occasion. Video conferencing software was used throughout all Commission of Inquiry hearings. Held a total of 74 hearings variously at the Grotto Bay Beach Resort, Hamilton Parish, Willowbank Resort and Conference Center, and the Royal Bermuda Regiment Warwick Camp in Warwick. Mr. Speaker, the Commission of Inquiry received a total of 53 claims. 18 were heard, 15 were denied, 10 were withdrawn, and 10 were closed by commissioners for jurisdictional reasons. Mr. Speaker, honorable members will note that the report makes a considerable number of recommendations. These apply to each of the various cases considered and are divided into actions to be taken by the legislature, private individuals, and other entities. Mr. Speaker, the government now sees the report, will examine the recommendations in detail and determine what can be done to address them. I would highlight for honorable members that the recommendations include that the government considers establishing a permanent mechanism of state machinery to review claims concerning the historic loss of properties. The mechanism should be fully resourced with human and financial resources to address all claims and concerns post the COI, ultimately with a view of having a legal framework in place to facilitate remedies and or an award of compensation. That the government ensures that the history of Tucker's Town and St. David's Island's expropriations are memorialized suitably by mandating its inclusion in Bermuda history taught in our schools, its placement in libraries and other repositories, and by erection of a suitable physical monument, ideally situated both in both Tucker's Town and St. David's Island. And third, the government establishes an independent land tribunal to deal with all outstanding legacy issues involving historic losses of land in Bermuda and to make recommendations based on the findings of the Commission inquiry and others that may emerge. Mr. Speaker, the work of the Commission was greatly enhanced by a team of administrative staff, legal counsel, researchers, and investigators. The final editing of the report was done by former Permanent Secretary, Mr. Robert K. Horton, and his oversight has proven invaluable to producing this final report. Mr. Speaker, honorable members will recall that in fiscal 2019-2020, $723,000 was budgeted for the work of the Commission, 
with the advent of the pandemic and the inability of the commission to meet your evidence and performance functions as intended, the time within which the work was done had to be extended. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, as report indicates, and will be supported by eventual release of the appendixes, this is among the most detailed and painstaking tasks undertaken by an independent body. There can be no doubt that the work of the commission was an exercise in determining the truth of painful histories and giving voice to claims that others rejected or refused to hear. Mr. Speaker, the cabinet office determined to fund the ongoing work of the commission, which unexpectedly carried on into this fiscal year and has done so from savings realized in the overall budget for head nine. No new money was requested or required, and I can advise Honorable House that there will be no requirement for supplementary funding in this fiscal year for this purpose. Whilst the final costs are not yet available, I will revert to this house with those costs once the final report is printed, the website upgraded, and the appendixes uploaded, and the final service provider costs are paid. Mr. Speaker, this will make difficult reading for some. For others, it will represent the last mile of a race that they have run for decades. History is a delicate thing, Mr. Speaker, and it must be handled with care and treasure as it is in a fulsome understanding of history that we create a stronger present and a better vision for the future. I will invite this honorable house to consider this report by a motion to be introduced for that purpose. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I would refer this honorable house to the statement I made in June 2019. The words frame all that the commission represents and the government's intention in addressing this issue. And I quote, Mr. Speaker, truth can be uncomfortable. Unearthing historic wrongs may be inconvenient for some. It may well be that some of those who are victims and those who committed wrongdoing have since passed on. But it is never too late for justice. That justice can take many forms. For some, it may simply be the opportunity to be heard and have their claims acknowledged. While for others, it may confirm the legal standing they have long asserted. The process of providing justice starts with a step towards truth." End quote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Premier. Members, the next statement this morning is in the name of the Minister of Finance. Minister, would you like to present your statement at this time? Please, as you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Continue on. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to inform this Honourable House of recent travels to London and Brussels, along with the Acting Financial Secretary, as part of the Ministry of Finance's ongoing program of engagement and advocacy with key stakeholders and trading partners. I will also provide an update on my work last week in New York as I again provided support to the Bermuda Business Development Agency in their promotion of Bermuda as a center of excellence in climate risk finance. Mr. Speaker, my visit to London and Brussels spanned the period from November the 14th to the 23rd. During my time in London, I had the opportunity to accompany the Premier to the Joint Ministerial Council session on economic resilience at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. The Council was chaired by the Minister for the Overseas Territories, Amanda Milling, MP. The Cross Whitehall Departmental Engagement included HM Treasury, led by the Exchequer Secretary, Alan Watley, MP, and focused on building economic resilience in the territories. It provided the opportunity to share experiences on managing economies post COVID-19 and the impact to some as a result of the UK's departure from the European Union. It was highlighted that as a result of external impacts such as COVID-19, natural disasters and climate change, territories have been gravely affected by the resultant fiscal and economic challenges. It was therefore agreed the UK will work alongside territory governments to appropriately explore opportunities for infrastructure development and assistance in sound public financial management and effective fiscal planning, particularly supporting the diversification of economies through building resilience and investment. During the discussions, we affirm Bermuda's ongoing commitment 
as a leading compliant financial services jurisdiction to cooperate on meeting evolving international regulatory tax standards. Mr. Speaker, during that week, we also had the opportunity to meet with senior officials at the Bank of England, including experts addressing financial stability matters and the chief executive officer of the Prudential Regulatory Authority. Bermuda's Financial Policy Council was established in 2015 as an advisor to me as Minister of Finance on financial st system stability matters. Their advice has been an, an important input as the ministry has developed strategies and policies to address many of the relevant financial challenges that Bermuda has faced. The UK Financial Policy Council has been operational for a significantly longer period, and it was therefore helpful to understand how the UK work and framework in this area continues to evolve. In addition, the meeting provided the opportunity to have discussions on issues of common interest and challenge. The PRA, in turn, were very complimentary about the work of the BMA and expressed their positive views of the robustness of the Bermuda regulatory framework. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, during the week, we were also able to meet with the chair of Lloyd's, Mr. Bruce Carnegie Brown. He then graciously hosted a lunch at the Lloyd's offices, which was attended by CEOs of Lloyd's members, who also had Bermuda operations. These discussions reinforced the symbiotic relationship between Lloyd's and Bermuda, while also highlighting the important role played by the Bermuda insurance market in the UK risk mitigation program. Mr. Speaker, the Brussels segment allowed us to continue our advocacy program begun in 2019 with senior persons in the European Commission and Council. We had the opportunity to meet with senior officials with the Commission's tax directorate, including a member of cabinet for EU Commissioner Paolo Gentilino, Gentilino and the European Commission's director for direct taxation, tax coordination, economic analysis, and evaluation. We discussed Bermuda's positive efforts to effectively implement economic substance requirements and country-by-country -country reporting. We also had a dialogue on the recent OECD G20 international agreements on taxation and key aspects of the approach being considered for implementation at EU level, particularly like the third countries. Mr. Speaker, just a um, point of order. Um, with all due respect to the Minister of Finance, he is not following the statement. There are many variations to the statement that he's, made, that he's reading. Okay. Um, the draft in the updated version um, is the... Um, the, uh, the opposition leader, your point was that the the copy that, that the minister is reading from is different from the copy that you have. Yeah. Um, yes. yes, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Um, Speaker, the advice of the document was provided by nine o'clock. Yes, that's what I was about to say. I think that the revised one, um, opposition leader, the revised copy should be on the SharePoint. Okay, thank you. You're probably you're probably going by the um, original draft that was done, but there was a revised copy that was put up there. Thank you very much. No problem. Good. I was just trying to follow what you were saying. That's why I just took a moment to, to come along there. Okay. Thank you. No problem. You continue, Mr. Speaker. Yes, continue, continue. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I also had the opportunity to have a meeting with the chair of the Code of Conduct Group, Ludmila Petkova, in the, in the Council of the EU. The Code of Conduct Group is composed of high-level representatives from the EU member states and the European Commission. One of its tasks is preparation of the revisions of the EU list of non-cooperative jurisdictions for tax purposes. I am pleased to share that our meeting with Ms. Petkova was her first meeting with a non-EU country since she was re-elected as chair in January of 2021. Bermuda's dialogue and cooperation with the Council of the European Union and the Code of Conduct Group was discussed as being exemplary. Mr. Speaker, 
Premier and I also had the opportunity to meet with the European Commission's Director General or the Directorate General for Financial Stability, Financial Services, and Capital Markets Union, John Berrigan. Bermuda was recognized for our importance in the global insurance industry. During the meeting, we discussed the crucial role of insurers as investors in the carbon neutral economy and in helping the world prepare for climate risks. In addition to presenting Bermuda as a center of excellence in climate risk finance, we also shared Bermuda's advancements within the crypto asset regulatory space. This is an area where Bermuda was an early mover adopting regulation in 2018 which still exceeds in some areas the requirements of the Financial Action Task Force. The Commission particularly praised Bermuda's work to meet anti-money laundering rules, which was described as a model for other countries. As my first visit to Brussels since the pandemic began, these meetings were a vital opportunity to reinforce Bermuda's outreach efforts within the EU and to strengthen the relationships with these important, this, this important trade partner and regulatory partner. Mr. Speaker, during the past week, I once again had the opportunity to lead a Bermuda delegation on a marketing trip organized by the Bermuda Business Development Agency. During this trip, Bermuda was ably presented by officials from the BDA, the BMA, the BSX, and the Ministry of Finance. The purpose of the trip was to inform key asset allocators on the crucial factors that make Bermuda a prime jurisdiction for climate risk finance business. The series of meetings, lunches, and dinners provided an excellent platform promoting Bermuda to important influencers and decision makers. Ensuring the growth and diversification of Bermuda's international business sector is a critical part of stabilizing and strengthening Bermuda's economy. Therefore, we intend to continue to support initiatives such as this, which are important for the expansion of Bermuda's client base. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I would again note my strong commitment to take necessary action to prudently build a stronger, more resilient Bermuda. We recognize that having a thoughtful and strategic program for engagement and advocacy must be a core part of our work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I believe you're on mute. Yeah, I, I was muted, sir. Right? Um, members, the next statement is also in the name of the Minister of Finance. Minister, would you like to proceed with your second statement? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just, as a way of um, advising colleagues, that a revised copy of this statement was also distributed at 9 a.m. this morning. Yeah. And both, Speaker, both revised copies from the previous and this one should be on SharePoint. I'm just having Mr. Leon to confirm that um, they are up there, but they, should, they were sent early up. Okay. Mr. Speaker, the first one wasn't on SharePoint a minute ago. No, okay. this one there is not on at this time either. Okay, we're checking with Mr. Lamb as we speak, okay? Thank okay. you. Mr. Speaker, honorable members will recall that on November 12th, I gave a ministerial statement on the 2021-22 half-year performance. I also committed to report to this honorable house on the updated 2021-22 revised estimates of revenue and expenditure, resulting from a, from a detailed 2021-22 mid-year performance assessment. Further, I undertook to provide an update on the continued impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on government revenues and expenditures for fiscal 2021-22. So Speaker, in, a, in accordance with these commitments, I rise this morning to provide this honorable house with the results of the mid-year performance assessment and advise on the revised budget for this fiscal year. Mr. Speaker, as a result of measures taken to keep Bermuda open for business in 2021, after severe disruptions in 2020 to combat the spread of COVID-19, the Bermuda economy is estimated to have grown by three to 5% in the first three quarters of 2021. The majority of the key economic indicators, such as employment income, imports, visitor spending, construction activity, and retail sales increased during this period. Although several of the 2021 key economic indicators experienced positive results, it should be noted 
that some of these figures, such as imports, construction, and tourist arrivals and spending, are below the 2019 figures. This indicates that the economy is moving in the right direction, but has not fully recovered to pre-pandemic levels. Speaker, I will now speak to the results of the 2021-22 mid-year review analysis. The original revenue budget estimate for 2021-22 was 998.9 million. The ministry estimates that revenue yields for 2021-22 will increase by a small amount of $8 million to $1 billion, $7 million. Mr. Speaker, Key factors contributing to the revenue estimates include the following. Increase in customs duty of 20 million, or 7% over the original budget. The original budget of $200 million was conservative based upon the unknown impact of further COVID-19 restrictions. However, as these restrictions were relaxed, we have seen increases in economic activity reflected by in an increase in imports an increase in stamp duty of $4 million due to the increase in land conveyances from the sale of real estate, decrease in passenger and transportation infrastructure taxes of $5 million. This decrease continues to reflect the slow recovery of the tourism economy due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, and payroll taxes remain on budget. And I'll reference expenditures and in particular current account. Mr. Speaker, original current account expenditure of for 2021-22 was forecast to be $903 million. Current expenditures for fiscal 2021-22, excluding debt service, are now projected to increase by $56.9 million, which will revise current expenditures to $959.9 million. Mr. Speaker, the primary reason for this increase directly relates to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Based on the submissions by ministries coupled with the Ministry of Finance forecasts, additional COVID-19 expenditures are estimated at approximately $21.3 million for this fiscal year. These additional COVID-19 expenditures directly relate to the impact of the third and fourth wave of COVID-19 which occurred during the April, May, and August, September periods. The related rise in positive cases triggered a requirement for increased testing, contact tracing, lab operations, quarantine mandate, and benefits related to the temporary unemployment benefit program. Taking into account the amounts that were included in the government's 2021-22 budget, total projected spend for COVID-19 expenditures is approximately $34.8 million for the fiscal year, of which unemployment and related supplemental benefits are projected to total approximately $12.7 million. The pandemic has also significantly impacted the operations of the Bermuda Hospitals Board, resulting in reduced revenue and increased expenses, and consequently their need for further subsidy support. Honorable members would recall the statement made by the Honorable Minister of Health earlier this year regarding increases to the standard premium rate to address the shortfall. The increases passed by this Honorable House were not the full amount needed to meet the shortfall of income, as the Cabinet decided not to pass all of the costs to employees and businesses to reduce the size of the increase. This additional shortfall of $11 million will be funded from the Consolidated Fund to ensure that our hospital can continue operations. Mr. Speaker, as indicated in my ministerial statement on the 2021-22 half-year performance, further additional expenditures are anticipated which relate to significant government guarantee commitments made under the previous administration. These include the airport revenue guarantee expenditure of $16 million and the costs for Mortgage Point Caroline Bay estimated $5.3 million to fund the work of the joint provisional liquidators, building maintenance, lawyers, and consultants. Other areas of proposed additional spending include financial assistance at $1.25 million. 
Mr. Speaker, in my ministerial statement on the 2021-22 half year performance, I highlighted that it is imperative that the budget deficit target for fiscal 2021-22 is not exceeded, given the current high levels of public debt. As I noted on, the, on a number of occasions, a breach of the deficit target should be seen as a serious issue, as it could have a potentially negative impact on the cost of refinancing government debt in the future and on Bermuda's credit rating. Accord, accordingly, current expenditure savings have, been, have already been identified by all ministries in the amount of approximately $13 million to support the increase in expenditures. The majority of these savings is due to vacant positions throughout the government, which have yet to be recruited. Steps are also being taken to ensure that overtime is further managed and limited to use in essential matters only. In addition, ministries continue to re-examine and reduce lower priority budget expenditures to ensure the deficit target is achieved. Mr. Speaker, having considered the increase in revenue, the unbudgeted expenditures, and the already identified expenditure savings, it was recognized that there is also a need to consider the level of proposed capital expenditures to ensure that the original deficit target of 124.7 million was achieved. Mr. Speaker, I would therefore now provide further detail in relation to capital investment. The original capital expenditure component of the 2021-22 budget was set at $92.9 million. Capital expenditures continue to track below the expected level for an annual spend of $92.9 million for fiscal 2021-22. This decrease was mainly due to the continued impact of COVID-19 on the availability of resources required to deliver on capital projects. Therefore, the Ministry of Finance is proposing a $25 million reduction in capital expenditures for this fiscal year. This would revise the estimate for CapEx down to $67.8 million for 2021-22, an expenditure level which is in line with actual capital spending in the 2019-20 and 2020-21 fiscal years. Mr. Speaker, after factoring in both proposed current and capital expenditure savings, increases in revenue and the impact of work being done to further reprioritize spending, we remain confident that the budget deficit target $124.7 million can be achieved. It is important that we continue to ensure that fiscal measures are managed in a prudent and considered way, and that we continue the fiscal discipline that is required for the achievement of a balanced budget in as timely a period as possible. In that regard, it is intended that the government will continue its work to, pro to progress on the implementation of the government reform initiatives, including rationalization of all government departments, quangos, and services. Mr. Speaker, in closing, we recognize that these are extremely challenging times, not only for governments, but also for individuals and businesses. We remain conscious of the continual need to provide appropriate support for our community while ensuring that we execute a financial and fiscal strategy that is credible and sustainable. As we continue our work to appropriately manage the fiscal affairs of this country, our focus remains on taking actions in a way that contributes to a bright future for all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Minister. Members, the next statement this morning is in the name of the Minister of Transport. Minister, would you like to present your paper? Minister? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me, Mr. Speaker? Yes. All right. Continue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in March of this year, during the budget debate, I announced that as part of the government's commitment to protecting the island's environment, the Ministry of Transport is starting by purchasing 30 electric buses. The buses were purchased from Golden Dragon Bus Company Limited in China in August. Each bus cost $114,200. By comparison, the last diesel bus purchased from Portugal in 2018 cost $250,000. The company recently completed the pre-delivery inspections 
and is currently preparing the buses to be shipped from Shanghai to Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, I'm very excited to announce that this project has progressed despite global supply chain issues. We anticipate that the buses will be arriving on three shipments over the next few months, but more so because they are scheduled to go in service in April of 2022. Mr. Speaker, an engineer from Golden Dragon Bus Company will be based in Bermuda for three months after the buses arrive to support with commissioning and training of the Department of Public Transportation staff. Additionally, the department's technicians will participate in electric vehicle training online via the Institute of Motoring Industry, UK, and locally via the Bermuda College. The department is also recruiting additional bus operators to ensure that we have the resources required to provide a reliable and consistent public bus service. The job adver advertisement will run from the 17th of December through the 31st of December of this year. Mr. Speaker, as part of the government's economic recovery plan, we are in the process of constructing interim charging stations at Dockyard, St. George's, and Fort Langton bus depots to support the initial 30 buses until the permanent charging infrastructure is ready. These charging stations will be fed from existing Belco circuits and completed in March of 2022. The initial RFP for the new electric buses envisioned transitioning the entire bus fleet to electric over 10 years. The permanent charging infrastructure will accommodate the whole fleet. There will be a total of 30 charging stations servicing 60 buses, 60 bus bays, a 450 kilovolt amp rooftop solar PV array, and a battery energy storage system at the Fort Langton Bus Depot. The RFP for this new infrastructure is concluding and the contract award is anticipated early in the new year. The bill will take one year to complete. Mr. Speaker, although the RFP included buses with wheelchair access, the new buses are not wheelchair accessible. We have revisited, re revisited feedback from the 2019 transport green paper, consulted with relevant stakeholders, and believe that a dedicated program would better serve persons with motorized wheelchairs. The ministry is currently working on a paratransit program, and I will be sharing more on this initiative in February. Mr. Speaker, I take this opportunity to remind commuters who use public buses and ferries to follow the Ministry of Health COVID-19 guidelines for their travel for traveling on public transportation, not only for their safety, but also for the safety of the hardworking staff of the Departments of Public Transportation and the Department of Marine and Port Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member, the next statement this morning is in the name of the Minister of Education. Minister, would you like to present your statement? Uh, Mr. Speaker, can you see me? See you and hear you. Continue. Okay. Uh, just having a few technical difficulties, just waiting for the statement to pop up on my screen. Okay, there it is. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, this morning I rise with my honorable colleagues and the community at large to talk about the work that will be undertaken for the establishment of a history and legacy committee. Mr. Speaker, Many of us are walking on paths that have been tread for us by those who came before us. Our parents, grandparents, educators, political and community leaders, some of whom were groundbreakers and most of whom were average citizens. Their effort to develop Bermuda, to develop the Bermuda that we live in today have created opportunities for us to continue to improve Bermuda so that we can make our nation better so that we can all thrive within our community. As we move forward with education reform, we know that change in education is not only desired, but it is a prerequisite to design the kind of public education system that inspires confidence and meets the educational, societal, and other related needs of each and every learner. Mr. Speaker, 
When important things are to be gained, like better education for each and every child, it is critical to keep in mind what we do not want to lose. These changes, which are the government's response to community calls for change, have brought about long-standing issues and concerns about Bermuda's educational history and legacy to the forefront. From lived experiences, discussion with our family members, concerns for our constituents, and from prior debates in this house, we know that our country's history is a difficult and painful one, especially for those of our parents and our grandparents' generations. It is rich with examples of our great history of buildings and trades, seafaring and shipbuilding, and developing and shaping young minds and leaders. However, it is also a painful and difficult history of racial segregation, separate and unequal schools, and class stratification. Along with my predecessors, I recognize that decisions have been made in decades past that continue to have profound implications on current and former students of the Bermuda public school system and Bermudian society. Many members know about the vital history of schools such as the Bermuda Technical Institute, Howard Academy, Warwick Sec, Prospect School for Girls, Robert Crawford, and others that have been closed or repurposed in decades past. Mr. Speaker, during the recent consultation on parish primary schools, I was reminded and reminded and reminded again about these critical issues and of the need to teach, learn, know, understand, and appreciate our educational history and legacy. In addition to listening and reading the numerous submissions from community members, I also received many messages of support and met directly with community members passionate about protecting and preserving the history and legacy of schools. Through this process, it has become evident that despite very good intentions and the imperative to bring about change for young people, a response was needed that met the moment of change that we are undertaking. Mr. Speaker, prior to making a single decision about parish primary schools, I resolved that these concerns had to be addressed. As I listened and considered the concerns, mostly of elders, with deep connections to particular schools and school communities, it was evident that while there have been significant contributions made to documenting and understanding Bermuda's educational history, more was and is needed. Therefore, I committed to establishing the History and Legacy Committee to engage with the community and to document, commemorate, and preserve Bermuda's educational and school histories and legacies. Mr. Speaker, of course, this effort could be easily misjudged as just another government committee being thrown at a problem. I can assure you and the members of this Honorable House that this is indeed not that. This past summer, I met directly with passionate and committed community members, including adult children of renowned educators, current and former educators, parents of current students, and many of whom were also public school alumni. I also met with technical officers at the Ministry of Youth, Culture, and Sports, historians and researchers, and community and cultural leaders to share feedback from the parish primary consultation to engage in deep discussions about the history and legacy of schools and education, and to obtain input on the development of the History and Legacy Committee. This assistance helped shape the vision and design of the History and Legacy Committee. Mr. Speaker, subsequently, I have initiated the work of the History and Legacy Committee with the appointment of the chairperson, Ms. Heather Whalen. Ms. Whalen will steer and oversee the work of the History and Legacy Committee. She has been working with members of the Ministry of Education team towards the formal establishment of this committee. The preparation work included, includes creating a small short-term working group to develop the terms of reference that the eventual committee will use, will use once it's fully established and constituted. Mr. Speaker, the working group's memberships consist of Ms. Heather Whalen, who is a retired Director of Community and Cultural Affairs. During her professional career, she spearheaded a number of international events and served as a head of delegation called for Carifesta, and was a member of the team organizing the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. She is the co-author of Bermuda's first national cultural heritage policy. 
Well known to members of the legislature, Ms. Whalen has co-hosted several ceremonies of the convening of the legislature and has also served as a member on the, of the committee to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the Bermuda House of Assembly. In addition, she has previously served on several governing committees and is a member of the Board of Education and the Interim Director of Age Concern. Ms. Whalen began her career in education, teaching history and civics at the Bothy Institute, where she also served as head of the Social Studies Department. Ms. Alberta Dyer Tucker is retired from public service, having served in numerous roles, including Assistant Cabinet Secretary and Senior Education Officer for Early Education, among other roles. She's also one of Bermuda's inaugural policy analysts and later co-led the Cabinet Office's, Office's intern program, which helped launch the career of many young Bermudians. Immediately before her retirement, Ms. Dyer Tucker helped organize a commission of inquiry, also serving as commission clerk. She later served as clerk to the Parliamentary Joint Select Committee inquiring into the events of December 2, 2016. She also briefly worked with the Commission of Inquiry into Historic Land Loss in Bermuda. She is also a former educator, having begun her career as a classroom teacher at Victor Scott Primary. Mr. Adrian Lodge has worked in the IT industry for over 20 years. He has received he has recently completed a privacy officer and cybersecurity course with a passion for always learning and improving. Adrian is a founding as a founder of local software development company Superturn Limited. He has led the BE DC Startup Weekend for Entrepreneurs and has volunteered at the annual hackathon and has taught WordPress. He also designs mobile apps and games for Bermuda Island Games, a local business he started to promote Bermudian culture digitally. Adrian holds a master's degree in information technology management from the University of Liverpool. Ms. Tanisha Otley is a Ministry of Education policy analyst and will provide research and secretariat support for the working group. Having reviewed and analyzed all of the submissions from the Parish Primary School consultation process, she has developed a deep and broad insight into the issues raised by community members regarding the history and legacy of schools and education. She is also a public school alumna Having graduated from the Cedar Bridge Academy, she obtained an associate's degree in liberal arts from Bermuda College and a bachelor's degree in social policy from the University of Lincoln, UK. Ms. Otley is currently studying towards a master's degree in public policy and management from the University of York, UK. Dr. Theodore Francis is an assistant professor of history at the Houston Tillotson University, an historically black college and university in Austin, Texas. He teaches African-American Caribbean and United States history courses. His research is focused on race, resistance, and black travel in the African diaspora, particularly the American, the Caribbean and the Americas. In 2020, Dr. Francis served as an expert witness for the Government of Bermuda's Commission of Inquiry into Historic Land Losses. He completed an extensive research report on the Tuckerstown portion of these land losses. Dr. Francis is the co-author of Prudent Rebels, Bermudians and the First Age of Revolution with Dr. Clarence Maxwell and Alexander Morris Kessler. His current book manuscript explores African-American tourism to Bermuda during the island's desegregation movement. Mr. Randy Scott is a retired parliamentary registrar, having served in this leadership role for many years after working as the assistant parliamentary registrar. After teaching for a period at the Robert Crawford School, Dr. Mr. Scott also worked in the Department of Statistics for more than 20 years. He is an alumni of West End Primary School and attended Sands Secondary School, having completed his high school education in the United States at Aaron Preparatory School in New York City. He attended Central State University in Wilberforce, Ohio, and graduated with a bachelor's degree in history education. Dr. Keto Swan is Professor of African American and African Diaspora Studies in Indiana University, Bloomington. The author of Black Power Inn and the forthcoming Pacifica Black, Oceania Anti-Colonialism and the African World. His scholarship is focused on 20th century Black internationalization, internationalism. In 2020, Dr. Swan served as an expert witness for the government of Bermuda's Commission of Inquiry into historic land losses. He could submitted a report on the St. George in the St. David's U.S. baseland section of these land grabs. He is the recipient of several awards, including fellowships from the National Endowment for Humanities, the American Council of Learned Studies, 
Harvard University Radcliffe Institute, the Wilson International Center for Scholars, Penn State's Humanitarian Humanita Humanita Humanities Institute, and the Australia University of Queensland. He is also the founder of Drinkwell, a professional oil consult consultation agency. Ms. Rhonda Wood-Smith is a senior manager of the Tourism Regulation and Policy Unit. She previously served as a senior policy analyst in the Ministry of Economic Development and Tourism and as the acting director of telecommunications. Ms. Wood-Smith has an extensive background in education. She began her career as a mathematics teacher at the Barclay Institute, graduated to the position of year three supervisor and culminated her career at the Barclay in 2003 as head of mathematics. Ms. Woodsmith served as the Bermuda Education Strategic Team Best Project Manager and was a member of the Hopkins Review Team led by Professor David Hopkins. She later served as the Chief Operations Officer for the Interim Executive Board of Education and the Board of Education, respectfully, and is currently a member of the Board of Governors at the Barclay Institute. Mr. Speaker, the working group's membership consists of a breadth of academic, technical, and practical knowledge and experience that is needed to plan and prepare for the work of the History and Legacy Committee. Under the direction of the History and Legacy Committee's chairperson, the group will develop the terms of reference for the History and Legacy Committee, identify types of professional and community roles and skill sets necessary for the committee, identify potential work streams and supporting organizational structures and processes for the committee project, for example, research, data collection, community engagement, communications, et cetera. Develop a provisional project plan outlining, with, outlining the milestones. Make recommendations on the likely duration of the short to midterm phases of the History and Legacy Committee. Make recommendations on the likely required time contribution of History and Legacy Committee members for the project and complete and present the terms of reference by March 31st, 2022. This two-part process in creating a working group to support the introduction of a committee has worked well before. This approach was taken regarding the School Reorganization Committee and allowed technical and community expertise from outside the Ministry of Education to be utilized to develop the groundwork for the larger body of work to be undertaken. Mr. Speaker, following the development of the terms of reference and the completion of these other responsibilities, some or all of the members of the working group will transition into the committee itself. Therefore, other members of our community will also have opportunities to serve on the History and Legacy Community Committee once it is formally and fully established in early 2022. This committee will use the terms of reference as a framework to guide and carry out longer term with the ultimate responsibility of documenting Bermuda's historical history, it, Bermuda's historical educational history, and making recommendations on the best ways to preserve, honor, and commemorate the history and legacy of education in Bermuda. I want to extend thanks to the persons who've made contribution to the development of the History and Legacy Committee. The interest, passion, and dedication of those committed to the documentation and celebration of our educational history will help with the necessary changes needed to the public education system and make our understanding of past educational achievements much richer in the process. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister. Members, the final statement this morning is in the name of the Minister of Labor. Minister, would you like to present your statement at this time? Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Go right ahead. Mr. Speaker, I rise before this honorable house to provide you with an update on the process improvements made within the Department of Immigration under immigration reform. I will speak on the process improvements made the automation project already underway, and the vital policy role moving forward. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Immigration is several years into its efforts to re-engineer outdated processes and procedures. The department has executed the following. In 2019, the department partnered with International Business and KPMG to engage in a lean process improvement exercise that led to a number of recommendations for quick wins to be implemented in the department. Some quick wins include the adding of a new multi-purpose copier, scanner, and printer, introduction of dual monitors for immigration work permit processing teams, and the initial review of the work permit application form. The vetting process was targeted in a pilot and subsequent introduction 
of the bulk submission and application process, which resulted in thousands of pages of last documents and savings of hundreds of hours in processing time. Mr. Speaker, these items were executed and further improvements continued in 2020, including the following. Following the first shelter in place of the pandemic in 2020, the department shifted to more efficient and cost effective processes, such as receipt of application fees online, issuance of documents via mail, and registered mail for sensitive documents. Documenting and revamping of the workflows for all major application types help identify common challenges and opportunities. Rearrangement of the teams to the new streamlined process within the department increased resilience within the teams and reduced reliance on any one individual. Course training of various teams occurred. The department revamped its landing page on the government portal to allow customers to more easily obtain vital information, application forms, and application fee rates. A new telephone system was introduced within the department in 2021 to allow individuals to have direct lines, voicemail, and to improve the robustness of the telephone infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, significant process has been made between 2019 and 2020. However, with all the process improvements made, the pandemic demonstrated to the department the critical importance of having strong web-based IT systems that would allow the department to carry out, carry on even if staff were out of office. Unfortunately, the legacy systems of the department lacked the core functionality and with staff out of office for significant periods of time, the gains made from process improvements led to rising frustration as few staff were in office to produce the work. Consequently, the department has turned its efforts to aggressively advance automation. In the speech from the throne of November 2021, the government undertook to digitize the immigration application process. This work originally commenced in November 2020, and in early 2021, the department had selected Microsoft Dynamics as its chosen platform to implement an end-to-end -end application and processing system. Mr. Speaker, the objectives of the automate automation project is to transition as much as possible away from paper-based processes to an end-to-end -end electronic solution. The scope of the pro project in this phase includes, but it's not limited to, electronic submission of applications, electronic payment of application fees via a payment gateway, electronic workflow, electronic vetting and validation, automated electronic status updates, and limited ability to log in and obtain status updates, electronic approval by the Minister for Immigration Senior Leadership, electronic production and distribution of final immigration documents, and the department's ability to report on all activity within the system. The digitization of application processing, workflows, and document production is a costly and complex process. The department is implementing the project in a phase to allow it to rapidly develop and launch basic function functionality first, and then over time, in an iterative manner, to release additional functionality. Substantial work is still yet to be undertaken in reviewing other immigration systems and making the appropriate enhancements. It must be stressed that the functionality in this early phase will be basic and the department will release enhancements over time. Mr. Speaker, from 2018 to date, the minister's role has been unchanged from prior periods with respect to making decisions on all application types. When the Ministry of Labor was established in June 2020, the practice of the minister approving or rejecting applications was continued as had been done in the past. Prior to 2020, the board's primary function as delegated by the minister had been to review and consider work permits and other application types on behalf of the minister. For many businesses in Bermuda, the pandemic required them to think and do things differently. 
I was appointed as minister responsible for immigration at a time when most private sector businesses and the government were struggling to do business. In addition to workflow, personnel, technology, and process changes already underway, the board's role was reviewed and the role of the Immigration Board was adjusted, consistent with the Act, to provide policy advice to the Minister and the necessity to consider work permit applications was transferred from the Board to the Minister responsible for Immigration. This approach is in alignment, in a direct alignment, with the work already being done on immigration reform, the process re-engineering work on the way, and readjustments required due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Speaker, the benefits of such change to the processing of work permits includes the ability to meet more frequently and for longer durations of time, the ability to consider all applications without the need to defer them to the next meeting, the direct privilege of the minister to request additional information and for the request to be proved for clarity, immediate and direct contact with Bermudian applicants by the department based on the minister's desire to know applicants' experience during the recruitment process and decisions are communicated to employers slash representatives faster. Mr. Speaker, a prerequisite of the department's automation is that immigration senior technical officers must be fully acclimated with presenting applications, making recommendations, and interacting directly with the minister. The re-engineering process has facilitated senior technical officers gaining this experience and skill set. Mr. Speaker, in accordance with the legislation in 2020, as the minister responsible for immigration, I engaged the immigration board to provide policy comments, advice, and recommendations on the review of the 2015 work permit policy and the government's policy paper for long-term residents. Moving forward, the ministry seeks to better utilize the board by having it focus more on policy formation and providing advice to the minister. This is designed to enhance strategic decision-making and oversight on immigration strategic reform priorities. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Immigration, like many other government departments, is under immense pressure to modernize its services through an increased use of technology. The investment in technology infrastructure and developing human resource capacity to utilize the new technology is critical to the government enhancing the delivery of service that will benefit the people of Bermuda, our businesses, and guests. A new re-engineered model of operation is required for us to progress past our current state that admittedly is simply not good enough. While some in the community may be reluctant to the may be reluctant to accept these changes. For various reasons, it should be made clear that we cannot continue operating in the same way and achieve results that meet our current and future needs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Members, that brings us to a close of our statements for this morning. And the next item this morning is the reports of committees. And there are none. We we'll now move on to the question period. And just for clarification, the, quest, the written questions that were on the agenda for last week to the uh, Minister of Finance and the opposition leader, they were carried over, but the Minister is prepared to provide the answers for those today. So we're going to start with the written questions from last week before we move on to questions from today's statements. With that said, Opposition Leader, would you like to put your questions to the Minister of Finance from last week? And all three have been indicated a oral response. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, our Minister. Will the Honorable Minister please confirm for this Honorable House the total amount paid by the government individually to KPMG, PWC, Deloitte, and EY Bermuda for the period commencing April 1, 2020 and ending October 31st, 2021. Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, for Ernst & Young, the total is $4,357,209.
for Deloitte, it's $240,274.90. For PwC, $594,200. And for KPMG, $880,132.22. For a total of $6,071,816.12. Thank you. Um, uh, supplementary question or? Yes, yeah, supplementary. Okay, put your supplementary. Minister, with that total of approximately $6 million, um, is it feasible that the minister could have, in effect, set up a department to address special projects, given that we've paid out $6 million? We, um, could have competent people in a special projects area within government that can reduce these expenses. Is that uh, approximately, actually, I'm sorry, four point, approximately $4.3 million of the $6 million that was spent are related to uh, the Morgan's Point project and the engagement and the appointment, I'm sorry, by the courts of joint division of liquidators in the name of E and Y. So if the courts had directed the government to set up a department to do this, I guess the government would have looked at the priority of doing that and staffing it appropriately if we had the people to do that. The courts appointed an independent body to service liquidators and more than 60 plus percent of the amount spent on consultants is related to the court appointment of the JPLs. Do you have a supplementary? No, that's that's fine. Okay, would you like to move on to your third question? My second question. Second question, rather, yes. Will the Honorable Minister please inform this Honorable House both the purpose and terms of engagement for each Speaker, uh, let's start with uh, first is the cabinet office. Uh, there are four engagements. Uh, the first relates to an engagement with EY, uh, who provided some work analysis on the feasibility of attracting international companies in order to establish a technology hub in Bermuda. That contract at a value of $70,000. Uh, the second contract uh, was one granted to PwC for $276,000. They were for professional services rendered with respect to three uh, projects. First was to conduct an economic impact assessment on the one year residency certificate policy offered by the government. That had a $25,000 cost. Second was to conduct a feasibility study on the establishment of a medical tourism facility in Bermuda. And the third was to conduct a feasibility study for the establishment of the vertical farming industry in Bermuda. Third contract relates to the IDT department. Again, the recipient was PwC. $150,000 contract to perform an analysis of the information architecture of government's portal, gov.bm. And then the fourth and final one is professional services, KPMG, related to the post office. And that contract had a value approximately $20,000. The next ministry is the Ministry of Finance. There are five different contracts. The first was Deloitte for $234,809.90. This is a contract that has been in place for a number of years, and Deloitte provides administration and support services for the Bermuda Tax Information Reporting Portal. The second is with EY Bermuda for the $4.287 million related to Morgan's Point, Caroline Bay. Third is uh, PwC 
a series of uh, professional engagements. Uh, the first is evaluation uh, of Georgia's Bay uh, that is part of the Caroline Bay project for the purposes of determining a carrying value on the government's financial statements in support of a request by the Auditor General. Second is uh, for the phase one development of an economic and cash flow model for the government of Bermuda related to the development of an economic uh, recovery plan. And the third was to do some work uh, around the unemployment benefit application internal audit report where they were assessing and reviewing the protocols in place for the unemployment benefit program. All told, uh, that was for $96,500. Uh, the fourth one is for $7,490, which is provision of the secondment services to the Office of the Tax Commissioner in connection with the update of the payroll tax cal uh, calculator Excel tool for fiscal 2021 2022. This is an annual uh, assignment in as much as there are changes to the payroll tax calculations and the work that's done is usually to validate that the calculator that is used by employers to calculate taxes due to the government is up to date and accurate. And then the final one, fifth one, would be the register of companies, KPMG recipients, uh, $224,943.60 variety of engagements, three in particular. First, implementation of, of the Economic Substance Act. Uh, second, ROC fee structure review. And the third, uh, ROC uh, fee structure review phase two. Next ministry is the Ministry of Health. Uh, KPMG, the recipient, the amount of the contract, $131,250. Professional services rendered for universal health coverage roadmap. Uh, the next ministry to Minister of National Security, the Media Police Services Department, and the firm being Deloitte. The contract value of $5,465. Professional services uh, rendered in connection with the large tax investigation. The final would be a non uh, ministry department, the Office of the Auditor General. Uh, two contracts, the first, it, KPMG value of $496,437.22. Professional services rendered in connection with various outsourced public authority audits. These would include the Bermuda Monetary Authority for 2019 and 2020, Bermuda Hospitals Board for 2018 and 2019, Bermuda College for 2021, Office of the Auditor General 2018, and one public sector accounting standards course. The other piece of work to PwC for $71,000, professional services rendered in connection with various outsourced Quango audits. And this related to audits for the Rita Shipping and Maritime Authority for the years 2019-2020. Thank you. Um, A supplementary of... Yeah, supplementary. Go ahead. Can the minister confirm the details of the tendering process for these engagements. Understood? Mr. Speaker, I do not have the information at hand. I would have to assume that these uh, engagements go through the normal procurement process unless a waiver is granted by uh, the cabinet. Okay. Well, supplementary, are you okay? Supplementary, I'd like to have the undertaking that yeah, bring this information back to the house, please. Because to me, it's request, a question. Senator, any request to have him get, get information brought back? Yes, please. And speaker, if it is appropriate for me to share the information, we will then bring it back to the House Assembly. Okay. The, the minister's taken an indication, depending on whether it's appropriate to be shared publicly here, it will be shared. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, because I think it's important that because of the scale of these engagements, that Bermudians have, who are professionals in this field, that I was sure that they have had an opportunity to be no problem in these initiatives. No problem. Okay. Uh, that's it for your I, second question. Would you like to do your third question? I'll do my third question. Go right ahead. 
Will the Honorable Minister please summarize for this Honorable House the details of the completed engagements by company and ministry for the said period, along with the engagements yet to be completed by company and ministry? Minister? Speaker, with respect to completed work by ministry and firm, uh, they are as follows. The cabinet office, the vendor being EY, project being the technology hub. EY has submitted their final report for review by a subcommittee. Review is due to take place in the, in the coming weeks. With respect to PwC, there are four projects, one year residency C certificate, the medical tourism initiative, vertical farming initiative, and the analysis of the gov.bm portal. PwC have submitted their reports and their Contents are being considered by stakeholders for next steps with respect to the one year residency certificate. Um, the PwC and the medical tourism and vertical farming reports have been submitted. Data is being analyzed by stakeholders and the process is ongoing. And with respect to the gov.bm portal, the work has been completed and a roadmap has been developed for IDT to implement uh, its recommendations. With respect to the Ministry of Finance, PwC, the Georgia's Bay Accounting and Valuation Review, uh, the provision of an accounting valuation for the Caroline Bay Project in connection with consolidated, uh, and consolidated fund audit. That work has been completed and is reflected on the government's balance sheet for the whopping guarantees that the government had to uh, honor, now been recognized on our balance sheet for the grand total of $1. Uh, phase one of budget and economic cash flow models. That project uh, has been completed as per the agreement. And the third project, the unemployment benefit application internal audit. Uh, PwC reviewed the unemployment benefit information technology controls and made recommendations for enhancement. With respect to KPMG, uh, the update on the payroll tax calculator, the update was completed. Payroll tax calculators are in use. Implementation of the Economic Substance Act, APM built the questionnaire framework which supported the build of the Economic Substance Declaration System, which is currently in use. And the ROC fee structure review, the revenue engagement is complete and provides a basis for the implementation of a corporate regulatory fee upon completion of appropriate public consultation. With respect to health, uh, again, a KPMG project, a universal health care coverage roadmap. The deliverables, which inform the high level three year roadmap, uh, have been completed. With respect to ongoing works by ministry and firm, uh, they are as follows For the Cabinet Office, PwC has two projects, one being Bermuda 2030 initiative. The engagement pertains to an analysis of Bermuda's, Bermuda becoming compliant with the United Nations 17 Sustainable Goals by 2030. This work is not yet complete, with an expected completion date early 2022. The second is for the Arbitration Center. The engagement pertains to research to validate uh, the business need for an international arbitration and dispute and resolution center in Bermuda. Work is not yet complete, with an expected completion date in early 2022. The Ministry of Finance, EY, relating to the Caroline Bay and their appointment as joint provisional liquidators. Uh, they will continue their work until the court decides uh, that the work uh, needs to stop. Deloitte, the tax information portal for the treaty unit in the Ministry of Finance. They provide ongoing administration and support services for Bermuda, uh, Bermuda's tax information reporting portal. And in the non ministry departments, uh, KPMG, and audits of public authorities. Audits are both completed and ongoing to various public authorities via the Office of the Auditor General. Thank you. Thank you Mr. For your so, supplementary? Point. Yes, I do have a supplementary. What's your supplementary? For those projects that have been completed, can the minister? Give us 
in total of the value of the final invoices for subservices complete for KPMG, PWC, and EY. Mr. Speaker, I provided the opposition leader with the individual projects and the detail and the costing for such. I think he has within his gift now the information required to perform a sum exercise. I think um, uh, I accept it. You accept it? Okay. For the supplementary? Um, no, that's it, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Thank you. Members, that brings us to a close of the written questions. We'll now move on to the questions from this morning's statement. The first question this morning is for the statement by the Minister of Finance in regard to the uh, report on the travel to the UK, Belgium, and the US. And uh, Minister of Finance, that question is from the opposition leader. Opposition leader, would you like to put your question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, on page two, um, the minister indicated it was therefore agreed that UK will work alongside territory governments to appropriately explore opportunities for infrastructure development assistance, etc. When will this project actually start and what resources will be required from Bermuda and who will lead the project? Minister? Um, Mr. Speaker, I think I, I'm barely back from the UK, and so I think that the the, the uh, standing up of the work on on this initiative has yet uh, not commenced, and so I cannot provide an answer at this point as to who's going to work on it and when until we get a sense of the scope of the project and what the UK has in mind with respect to this initiative. Okay, I'll accept it. Okay, supplementary. Um, Oh, new question. question. My second question. Second question? Go right ahead. Um, the minister met with senior officials of the European Commission and the European Council. Can the minister provide details on his discussions around the topic of the OECD tax harmonization and the BEPS initiatives and how they're impacting Bermuda? Mr. Speaker, I uh, shared with uh, the EU officials Bermuda's position. I and the 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 sentiment that I conveyed was not dissimilar to my public statements or the submissions that I had made uh, to the OECD during uh, the process of. The OECD developing the framework that is it is going to be introducing around um, global minimum tax. I would say that that work uh, is still ongoing. I think they have missed a number of deadlines, and I think the deadline of November the 30th is now been revised at some point uh, late in January. What I did convey is Bermuda's desire to do as we've always done, which is to be compliant uh, in these global initiatives and to work with. Uh, EU and OECD to ensure uh, that we are doing so um, in terms of the implementation appropriately. We expressed concerns about unintended consequences and potential impact. And uh, we, we thought, I thought it was particularly important that my submissions uh, would, would also be read, but I but also articulate the content of my submissions in my face to face interactions with officials. And so we spoke about the Bermuda um, insurance market. We spoke about the potential impact of, the, of this initiative, and uh, our, our concerns were, were duly heard. Supplemental, yes, on, supplementary on the issue of discussions with the EU Commission and Council. Um, the minister indicated that he met with Ms. Petkova of the conduct group, the EU conduct group. My question to the minister is, what action points, if any, were there as a result of that meeting um, that will provide us with further support as a 
cooperative jurisdiction under the EU Code of Conduct Initiative. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry, but there was, there was a lot to that, and, and I would, would, would have welcomed the opposition leader providing a, a repeat of the question, please. Um, opposition leader, could you just uh, repeat it uh, for the minister? Okay, so you met with the PECOVA, and you had discussions on the Council of European Union and the Code of Conduct. And as a cooperative jurisdiction for tax purposes, were there any action points that arose from that meeting to support our position as a cooperative jurisdiction in regards for tax purposes under the EU list? Well, Mr. Speaker, honorable members may, will know that Bermuda is currently on the white list uh, as it relates to our economic substance regime. And that regime is constant, consistently um, assessed by both the EU and the OECD. Uh, we continue to uh, highlight to Madam Petkova um, the, the objective of the economic substance regime, among other things, is to ensure that there is a level playing field uh, among uh, jurisdictions. And in as much as there are opportunities for us to point out where the Bermuda standard is higher than the global standard, that there should be an opportunity for the code group to make amendments to either lower the standard for us or to raise it for everybody else. We happen to enjoy a very positive and constructive relationship with the code group. The technical officers in, in the ROC and other parts of the government are in regular contact with the technical officers at the code group. And uh, I have um, met with Madam Fatkova, I think, at least two or three times uh, in the past, including the most recent trip. So we enjoy a good relationship, and I think if anything, it took away from the meeting is for us to keep doing more of the same that we're doing in terms of our compliance with the regime. Thank so you, that's Andrew, well. I missed that opportunity. Supplementary or further question? No, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Minister, the opposition leader was the only member had questions for you on that statement. However, we'll move on to your next statement. And again, next statement. And again, opposition leader. Would you like to put your question to the Minister regarding the second statement? Thank you very much. Um, on page three of his statement, he spoke to um, the current account expenditures excluding the debt service. My question to you in regards to the debt service and us mitigating increase. Can the minister confirm whether it is intention, it is his intention to refinance any debt this year, given the expected hike in interest rates in the markets? So my question is, is he going to refinance so that we as a country can capitalize on the low interest rates before they appear to increase in the near future. Speaker, I'm un uncertain if the opposition leader, when he says this year, is referring to the, this year, December this fiscal uh, 2021. Year. Um, so if it's this year, 2021, the answer to fiscal that is year. fiscal year. In terms of fiscal years, uh, the Ministry of Finance has started engaging uh, our uh, investment banking partners in a discussion on strategies around the impending maturity of uh, at least four tranches of debt. We have debt maturing in December of 2022, uh, January or February of 2023, November of 2023, and I think January, February of 2024. So we've started uh, having preliminary conversations, the keen eye on interest rates, and uh, those discussions are the early stage and um, will, be, will, will happen in earnest uh, at the turn of the new year. But we're certainly keeping a keen eye on uh, where rates are. But I think it's really important uh, to probably uh, advise the House and the people of Bermuda uh, in my preliminary conversations. Um, what I have been advised by uh, our banking partner in this space is that our bonds continue to trade very well. Right. And 
and the, and the spreads on on those bonds spreads in this case being the difference between the rate of the government's bonds and what they yield and the appropriate treasury security have continued to narrow and though uh, the rationale being uh, being suggested by our investment banks are that they are a reflection of the government strategy with respect to managing uh, the economy and its fiscal position. Thank you very much for that answer. Supplementary. The second question. Second question, go right ahead. On page four, he says um, he's talking about the expenses, additional uh, expenditure for the financial assistance. Can the minister provide the total? allotment for financial assistance to date from March 31st, 2021. Mr. Speaker, I don't have that number in front of me, but I certainly can revert with that figure. Thank you. Thank you. That's all my questions on this paper, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Opposition Leader. Mr. Minister, do you have a further number you'd like to ask a question in regard to that statement this morning? That's from MP Pyramid. Mr. would you like to put your question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Minister. My first question also arises uh, in relation to the same paragraph that the Honorable Opposition Leader took you to at page three of your statement, where you discuss the current account increase in expenditure of 60 million, and you noted that it include, excluded debt service. Uh, are you able to give this Honorable House uh, a figure as to what the debt service will be on an annualized basis? Um, if you don't have the precise figure, can you can you give us an estimated figure, ballpark figure? Thank you. Uh, the projected debt service number is one hundred and twenty-seven point five million dollars. Etched in my brain. Thank you. Thank you. Etched, tattooed on your arm, Minister. Perhaps. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. No supplementary. I do have a second question. Can you a second question? Thank you, Honorable Minister. At page five of your statement where you are dealing with uh, current expenditure savings in the second paragraph. You state that current expenditure savings have already been identified in the amount of approximately $13 million. In view of the $60 million increase in, in current expenditure, um, is, is the $13 million already identified for totality of the savings you would wish to see? Or will you see that $13 million in savings go up further, do you think? Mr. Speaker, I've indicated in my statement that I see the, the gap um, being closed by two or three different items. One is the incremental revenue, uh, others being reductions in current account expenditure and capital expenditure. So in totality, the increase in revenue coupled with the reductions in current account expenditure and capital expenditure uh, could be enough to kind of get us to the place where we meet our deficit target. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Which is supplementary. Thank you. Minister, if you see the current expenditure savings of 13 million and the capital expenditure savings uh, closing the gap, does that mean that there will not be any further savings above and beyond the 13 million of current expenditure savings? It does not. Uh, what we've done so far is we have identified uh, savings at this point in time with a clear uh, guidance to public officers that the opportunity to identify savings continues until we get through the fiscal year. As a general matter, I think that we should always be looking for ways to sharpen our pencil and do things better. And in as much as those create opportunities for savings, then we should uh, maximize them. Second supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Thank you. Um, Honorable Minister, where you explain the current expenditure savings that we've just been discussing, you say the majority of these savings are due to vacant positions throughout the government, which have yet to be recruited. Is that to be understood as a hiring freeze or just uh, a nudge? Hiring freeze, I'm sorry, I missed the last piece. Is it a hiring freeze, a positive mandate that they're not going to recruit into vacant positions 
or is it just encouragement on your part? Are you, did you get that? I did get it. Um, uh, Sorry, I'll, I'll put it again. No, no I, I, I got it. It's, got it's it. a hiring freeze. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the chairman. Members of Finance, there are no further for you this morning. The next is the Minister of, actually, um, I overlook one of the MPs had a question for Premier. So I'll put that one question and then I'll come back to transport. Um, MP Caesar. Yes, MP Caesar. Did you still want to put your question to the Premier? Okay, we'll move on then. If she, if she comes back, we'll have to come back to you. Um, Minister of Transport, you have a question this morning as well from MP Jackson. MP Jackson, would you like to put your question? Yes, good morning, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, uh, Minister. My question is referring to the third paragraph from the bottom. The first sentence says, the initial RFP for the new electric buses envisioned transitioning the entire bus fleet to electric over 10 years. So my question to the minister is, does this mean that we're in a 10-year contract with uh, Golden Dragon for the entire fleet. Minister? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, that No, that does not mean we're in a 10-year contract. Uh, what we are in, this is no different than purchasing a, a car, like the average person purchasing the car. Your contract is with the dealer until you drive it off the lot, and then after you drive it off the lot, uh, you rely on the warranty. So this is for the purchase of, 30, of these 30 buses, and then any future purchases, even if it is with Golden Dragon, uh, will be a separate contract. Supplementary? Uh, no, I don't have any additional supplementary. Okay, no further questions. Minister Dallas, any questions I will indicate for you at that time, at this time? The next statement that has uh, questions will be for the Minister of Education. Minister of Education, MP Jackson has would like to put a question to you as well. MP Jackson. Thank you and good morning, Minister. Um, good morning. First, I would like to say that, that uh, this is a welcome uh, concept uh, to pull together uh, this committee, the working group, and then the committee. Uh, so it, it's definitely a positive move. But I just have a question around what you envisage the outcomes from the working group to be. Um, and, the, and of course, I'm referring to um, the historical, the history and legacy committee. Okay, uh, part, of, part of this was, uh, one of the rationales behind this was, it was identified, um, as, I, as I articulated in the, uh, in the statement, it was identified that when we're talking about schools in Bermuda, lots of persons came out and were talking about the historical narrative and things that they had lived through and things that people had collected over the years. And what we recognize is there hasn't been any concentrated effort to document this in such a way that anyone that wanted to know what uh, the historical legacy of, of education in Bermuda and how it came to be the way it is, uh, it's just not, it's virtually non-existent. And I, and I used the simple analogy um, in, in a lot of my meetings and said, you know, this is good information we're hearing about a particular building and some of the nuances that persons wouldn't know. But if a student wanted to do a report on a school, where do they go and get that information outside of if they know someone who just happens to know it? And so part of this is not only to document that history, but how can we display it? How can it become a part of our curriculum? How can we preserve and, and present it in such a way that, that people for generations can see, this is what happens, this is why, how it happened, this is why it happened, here are the persons that contributed to it, here are some of the factors of why it did went the way it went and why it didn't go the way it went, and be able to do their own personal research. Um, we're looking at um, some of the things that came out of our conversations with the general public 
are things like monuments within parishes, renaming of schools, renaming of school, uh, um, renaming of school rooms uh, of, of famous educators, creating an actual location where persons can go and, and track the history of education in Bermuda. We're talking about, um, you know, a, a nearly 160 year legacy that is barely been scratched, has barely scratched the surface. And so what we end up with is a lot of anecdotal conversations around schooling in Bermuda and why things are done the way they're done and why uh, buildings were erected the way they were erected and, and why um, educators went one way versus another way without any actual documented history on that. And so because this is a project, because this was something that came up during the reform that we're doing now, but I also realized that, you know, for my own edification growing up, you'd heard people talk about Howard Academy. I don't know anything about it. You heard people, I come from uh, the Devil's Hill area, you hear people talk about Talbot School, uh, Powell's, um, you know, different, there, there, there have been lots of different things that have led to where we are in education now, and it does need its proper place in our in our society for persons to have. Oh, you went on, on mute, Minister. Oh, okay. Oh, there you are, you're back. Okay, so so putting putting to putting together this committee is a way of documenting that history um, and why why we chose the working group was where do we start? How do we how do we put together a framework of of collecting it? What is the best way to collect? What is the best way to display? What is the best way to preserve? So that's the purpose of the working group. And once they finish their work, the committee itself will then look at how do we action those items and put them forward. Yes, just a quick supplementary. Um, yes, go ahead. I, I know that this is just the, the beginning of what I hope will become a, a great national uh, uh, contribution. But whether whether we're looking at statues, websites, museums, um, whatever comes out of the working group, uh, first, I'm wondering whether we are looking at any kind of budget around how, what, to give some scope or guideline to the committee uh, from a budgetary perspective. And also, I'm just curious if we are going to have committee members that are engaging at, at that level of depth, whether there's going to be remuneration involved and you know what kind of uh, guidelines we would put around that, or whether this will be all a committee of volunteers. Um. And thank you. And that is a very, very good question. Um, the working group there is, we've looked within our within our existing budget and have um, found some funding uh, for a, a level of remuneration. Personally, I don't think um, it, it, I don't think you know the amount that we found is um, is and when I read you know, representative of, representative of the expertise that they are bringing. But because they recognize that this is such an important thing that needs to move forward, um, I, I suspect that um, you know a lot of their time will be considered volunteer time in this instance. Um, going into uh, though, going into past past the uh, working group stage, which uh, we anticipate will, as I said, leads up to March, the end of March, and going into the next fiscal year. Uh, we are looking to um, look more proactively within within the confines of our budget and setting aside funding uh, to do the, the necessary work uh, of the committee. However, part of the working group's mandate is to talk about things like that. What what sort of cost does some of this stuff uh, will uh, will, will uh, occur? And and so we we don't anticipate this being just a one off thing. This is um something that will uh, we're looking at the ministry of adding it into our programming as an ongoing process and so this is something that will, that initially there will be a huge amount of data collection up front but once that is done as we move forward over the years it's just a matter of um, um, collating that data and putting it out there thank you for the supplementary or question another question uh, nothing further at this time thank you mr speaker Thank you. Thank, um, thank you, MP Jackson. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, MP. Um, MP Caesar, would you like to put your question to Premier at this point? Okay. 
And, uh, Minister Labour, uh, there's a question for you in regard to your question, your statement this morning, and that's from the opposition whip. Opposition whip, would you like to put your question to the minister at this point? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Minister. Good morning to uh, my colleagues. Um, with respect to the matter raised by the Honourable Minister in his statement on uh, page three, about the middle paragraph, uh, where it says that uh, the department has selected Microsoft Dynamics as its chosen platform to implement end-to-end -end application and processing system for uh, to improve the immigration processes in Bermuda. Um, would the honorable minister please clarify um, who's going to be doing the work of, of actually designing the Microsoft Dynamics system uh, that that requires some custom significant customization? Uh, who has been uh, contracted to undertake that work? Minister? I know that um, IDT has been working with the Department of Immigration Offices and the vendors for um, the Microsoft Dynamics System. Um, is the question who is the vendor responsible? Mr. Speaker, uh, yeah, so my question was, uh, who would be undertaking the work? I, I, and uh, I may have presumed it was a consultant, um, but uh, the question is very much who. So if it's, if it's IDT, then, then that's sufficient for the purposes of my question, Mr. Speaker. And so for all of the immigration um, digitization and automation improvement um, work, IDT is the actual lead on the project. Are you satisfied with that? I am, Mr. Speaker. Supplemental? Yes, but you supplementary. What's the anticipated cost uh, for for that work at this point? That's somewhat of a difficult um, question to answer. Mr. Speaker, the total budget cost, as you would know, um, what we're going to do is these processes and phases. Um, there are a number of applications that we are automating and government has its own um, resources that can assist us with um, the automation of application types. In terms of the having all these systems harmonized so that they all can interact with one another, that is a, um, a more technical answer that needs to be provided. And so I'll endeavor to get that information and provide it to the honorable member. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sister Whip, are you comfortable with the response? The minister indicated you have to get that information for you. I am, Mr. Speaker. Uh, second question for the honorable yes, minister. Yes, it's a second question. Uh, would the honorable minister be able to uh, inform us uh, what are the broad phases and timings he's anticipating for uh, this project? Mr. Speaker, the automation of the majority of our application forms is slated for early January 2022. And so we want to have the majority of our applications forms um, available online in January of, of next year. In terms of the end-to-end -end processing, that's going to be to take a little bit more time. The aim is that the we're aiming for the next fiscal year for on end to end processing of, of the majority of application types. Thank you. Supplementary? No supplementary. Third, third question, Mr. Speaker. Third question, yes. Uh, given the uh, given that the automation should reduce time on task, or the, the one of the outcomes of the automation is to reduce time on task. How will the how will the minister uh, individually and personally reviewing every application um, make that process better? Won't it confuse the process, slow the process down? No. What you have to say is when we go into an automated process, there's the majority of the work is in vetting and validation. That is undertaken by the department. 
once you have automated um, processes, what you can do is process on a more timely basis. Right now, with a paper-based process, an officer or the minister or previously the board would have a specific time period in which they consider all applications. When you go to an automated process, you can process on a more, on a daily basis, as there is no need to transfer files. Um, one would just have to log into the system and and process or approve um, application types um, for the majority of the applications, which may be such as passport, which is the highest volume of the uh, applications um, we receive outside of, of work permits um, that don't require ministerial approval. So some of the processes require administrative approval, others require approval from the minister. So the minister does not um, process 100% of the applications received um, by the department. Supplemental, please, Mr. Speaker. Yes, uh, put your supplementary. Uh, yes, thank you, Honorable Minister. So to be clear, we're not anticipating a bottleneck of uh, work permit applications uh, with the minister individually reviewing them. Is that correct? Certainly not. What we want to do is we've identified that there is a, a, a problem is the way in which we're processing now. Number one, we need proper IT systems, but number two, if we fail to have the appropriate human resources, that creates the bottleneck. Um, so if we remove the level of human resource required to process um, application types, um, and a lot of that quality assurance, vetting and validation is done electronically, certainly we would have better turnaround times across the board for all application types, in particular work permits. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Stop Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Minister. I have no further questions. Thank you. Minister, that's the only member who had questions for you this morning. Mr. And, Speaker. Um, I'm going to. Supplementary, someone had a reference to Minister Labor? I actually have an answer to a question that was previously answered. Um, oh, oh, sorry. I thought it was a yeah. different voice. Okay, sorry, with that, Minister. Go ahead, put your, put your answer. And so to assist with. Um, IDT, we did have a business analyst, which was Maurice Stolke, um, who assisted with the automation and digitization process and the re-engineering process. The original cash capital budget for the project was $80,000. Um, the revised um, budget is yet to be determined for the next fiscal period, but it is assumed that that will um, in re re increase and we will revert back with that figure uh, when we present the budget for the 2022-23 fiscal period, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, Officer Whip, you got the best time of that? Yes, I have received that. Um, I thank you, Officer, for the uh, clarification and information. Uh, no supplemental from myself. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And. For the premier, the question in the premier head, I see if MP Caesar. MP, it was three. MP Swan. You also indicated you had a question? Yes, Mr. What's your question? Yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question was for. Uh, the uh, premier's question period. Is this the appropriate time to ask that? Not on his statement. But there's no premier's question today. There's no okay. premier. No, no premier's question today. So if it's not in reference to the statement, we'll bring that. We can move on. Thank you. Um, MP Famous, you've indicated to me that you had a question as well. I think I think there was confusion that members thought there was a premier's question. No, there's no premier's question. And we'll just bring this to a close. Members, that brings us to a close of the question period for this morning. Um, yes, Mr. Uh, Speaker. So my question was to the premier. But... Well, we, everybody's moving slow. I've asked a few times back and forth about members putting questions to the premier. All right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've actually moved on now. I've actually moved on.
everybody was dragging their feet on this for some reason this morning. Um, we moved on now to the to, to the next item on the order paper, which is the congratulatory and obituary speeches. Would any member wish to speak to that? 